following me boldly, even if wrongly, to wherever we were going with each of those songs. Uh, I invite you to uh, open in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We are continuing our study in Acts, and uh, if you recall, last week we looked at the first uh, 12 verses of this chapter as we looked at what we can all expect as we set out to fulfill God's mission, that we should not be surprised when we encounter opposition, that in fact Christ prayed for us, for all who would call upon him and who would be given this task of representing him in this world. He prayed for all of us that we would be kept, that we would be kept from deceit of the evil one who is seeking to undermine uh, the work that is being done in this world that God is doing and that he, that he is doing through us and in reaching people with the gospel. And uh, he prayed that, that we would be kept faithful, that we would not become overwhelmed in the task, but that we would find not within ourselves the sufficiency to do the task, to accomplish the work that we're that we're we've been called to do, but that we would find our sufficiency in Christ to step out boldly and to step out with mission and intent to take the gospel into this world. And so we should not be surprised when not everybody is totally okay with that, right? And so what we're going to see here as we, as we continue this journey uh, of, of the book of Acts we are going to see today the first of what will be three missionary journeys that the Apostle Paul sets out on. And each time he goes a little bit further and and accomplishes a little bit more, and we're going to take a look at each of those journeys in turn. Um, But today we're going to see that in the passage, um, I'm going to show you a map here, that just shows you where we're at so far. So we see on the far right of the screen in the, in the top right, there's Antioch um, that's in Syria, and that was their starting point. And then they, they travel over to Cyprus, which is what we looked at last week. That was Barnabas' home turf. And, and, and so Barnabas seemed to take the lead in that area. But then they set off, in our passage today, they set off from Paphos up into Lycia. They, they visit the cities of Perga, and then they end up in a different Antioch that's in Pisidia, which is in the area of Galatia. And so it's important for us to understand that, that this is where they're at, right? And so as they go into this territory, what we're going to see is that the Apostle Paul, from here on out, is taking the lead. Barnabas kind of falls into the background. He's not unimportant, but Paul absolutely takes the lead. And so what I'm going to do, what I normally do uh, as I preach is read through the entire passage, but we're going to be looking at um, quite a large passage today. And so we're just going to walk through it together, and I'll have the verses up on the screen of our main passage, um, and then just glean some thoughts um, as we as we go through our passage today. So this is Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 13. This is what verses 13 through 16 say. It says, Now Paul and his companions set out from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now, uh, I titled this this morning's message, The Promise Keeper, but I have to be honest that I, I toyed with the idea of titling this message, Beware of the Open Mic. Because here they're, 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 they're having church, right? They're in the synagogue and they're in, Paul and Barnabas are visitors into this city and they're at the synagogue and they're, they're going about it. They're reading their passages, they're reading the law and then they invite these guests to share a word. Beware of the open mic. Now, it could be used in very positive ways. 
in ways that you wouldn't anticipate. But here, Paul absolutely accepts this invitation and gives a full-on sermon. Now, I believe what we have here in Acts is really just a condensed version of everything that, that the Apostle Paul um, taught that morning. But what we see here is that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're gathered, they're at church, and here again, the, uh, the map, uh, we see that, that they're in this region, they're in a different Antioch, but then Paul addresses his audience. He said, um, uh, sorry, I lost my place. Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, like I do, motioning with his hand, uh, men of Israel, And you who fear God, listen. Now Paul knew his audience, and he sets out from here to address his audience in a way that they will understand. Now I think that this is a very important thing for us to point out. As we we have opportunity to share, what we're going to see as we we continue to follow the Apostle Paul's missionary journey efforts, We're going to see him in different settings. Now, every time he's in the synagogue, this is a very typical pattern that he is going to set. He's going to speak to the Jewish people. He is going to help them understand from the Jewish scriptures how they can understand God's promises being fulfilled in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ. But then we're going to see him in Acts chapter 17, where he's not in a Jewish synagogue. He's in a very uh, Greek setting And he is walking around um, Mars Hill and he sees all of these statues and everything and he addresses the people in a different way. And what we see the Apostle Paul doing is he, he analyzes his setting and then he seeks to address the audience accordingly. And I think that's so important for us to keep in mind as we have opportunity to to share the message of who Jesus is that we need to We need to learn how to tell the story. And we need to learn how to tell it in ways that that is respectful to the audience that we're sharing with. Now, I I aim to do that each and every week. Some weeks I hit the target better than others. But learning how to tell the story and, and giving signposts for people so that they can track the message. Now, they're they're going to be introduced to a lot of information maybe that they hadn't heard before. Just like even these Jewish people, they're hearing the signposts and they're tracking, but they're hearing a conclusion that they're not yet prepared for, right? So uh, the Apostle Paul is sharing new information with them. He's sharing with them a new revelation, but he he does it in a way that he brings them along so hopefully they will be able to reach the conclusion that he's hoping that they will come to. And so what does Paul do? He sets out here, he addresses them. He says, men of Israel and you who fear God. Now remember, those, those God-fearers are those who were not Jewish. They were Gentiles who, were, who had come to synagogue to hear about the God of the Jews, to hear about the Scriptures. Maybe they wanted to worship God, but they had not taken that final step yet to become Jewish. For whatever reason, they... They had remained in this court of Gentile God-fearers. And so Paul is addressing all of them. He says, men of Israel and you God-fearers, you who would fear God, listen up. I have a message for you. And then this is what he shares. He says, uh, continuing here in verse 17, he says, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All of this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, 
as he promised. Now what we see here, Paul covers about a thousand years of history in just a few sentences, right? And he makes some points here that I think are, are good for us to, to draw from this passage. First off, the people of Israel were chosen. They were chosen by God, not because they were anything spectacular, but simply because it was God's prerogative. We read that in Deuteronomy 7, 6. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And Deuteronomy 7 goes on to say, it's, it's not because of your power. It's not because of your might. It's not because of how beautiful you look. It's just because I chose you. And I have chosen you out of all of the people of the earth to be my instrument. So they were chosen. The next that we see in verse 17, it says that, that they were delivered, that God had chosen his people, that they made them great during their, their stay in the land of Egypt. With uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And that in their deliverance, they were preserved. They wandered the desert for 40 years. We read that, we're reminded of it in verse 18. It says that God put up with them for those 40 years. Kind of a funny little commentary there. Um, but that God had ultimately delivered them and preserved them to give them a place, right? So uh, he, had, he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. This is verse 19. And he gave them their land as an inheritance. And what we see in verses 20 through 22, God provides for their every need for hundreds of years. God proved himself faithful to the people of Israel, the goodness of God being seen time and time and time again as he had promised to Israel he would. He would preserve them, he would keep them, and that he would deliver to them all of these promises. He would make good on them. And that ultimately, we see that in verse 23, that it says that of this man, this is speaking, referring to David, of David's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Now, let's pause here for a, for a moment, because I think it's important for us to see what Paul is pointing out. He, God, was faithful to deliver to Israel his promise. Notice that Paul says it's for Israel. Paul believes, of course, that the, that the message of the gospel is for everyone. It's for the whole world. But God, and we'll get, we'll get more to that in just a moment, but God had made specific promises to this nation to the nation of Israel, specifically even to David, that he would preserve his throne. And God is making good on his promise to Israel. The first stage is always to see this message in relationship to Israel. When we divorce this message from God's relationship to the people of Israel, we get a sub-biblical dangerous theology where we begin to think that God has abandoned his people Israel. Now, is the relationship complicated? Absolutely. This is one of those situations you can just say it's complicated. Paul addresses it over three entire chapters in, when he wrote to the church in Rome. Romans 9, 10, 11 try to flesh out this complicated relationship that God has with this nation, Israel. But we have, to, we, we have to bring ourselves back and understand that all of these promises were given to this people, Israel. And we want to make sure that we're, that we're on solid footing when we're understanding this. That we're not putting ourselves in a place that we don't belong as Gentiles, as as these people who have been, the, as the scriptures say, 
grafted into this relationship, Israel still remains very much a chosen people by God. Do they do everything right? Do we need to put a rubber stamp of approval on everything that Israel does because of that? No. Not even God does that. But God, God is not done with Israel yet. God is going to turn his attention back to the nation of Israel and God is going to do his thing. But what we see here that the Apostle Paul in this passage, he is, he is giving this thousand year history of God's faithfulness to his people, to the people of Israel. And God is keeping his promises. We, we read in Psalm 132 verse 11, it says, the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. Now where is that promise? Well, that promise that is quoted and referred to in Psalm 132 is referred to, goes all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, where we read these words. It says, when your days, this is God speaking to David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now what we see as we follow the history there in, in Samuel is David's son who comes after him, Solomon. He indeed built a house for God's name but it becomes quite evident that this promise was not referring to Solomon. It was referring to yet another offspring that would come from this line, this very specific line of David. And I think the main point for us to draw as we, as we look through uh, these verses, chapter, uh, verses 17 through 23 is, as as Paul draws out this thousand years of history of the nation of Israel, God's dealings with them, the main point here, I think, is that God's purposes normally take a while to come to fruition. But God is working. It, take, it, may, it might take him what we look to see, hey, God, you're, you're surely taking your time to, to accomplish your task. But Peter wrote these words. He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's 2 Peter 3, verse 9. You know, we might, we might be looking at the timetable and wondering, what in the world are you doing, God? Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He promised that he would return. The writers of Scripture are saying, hey, look, he's coming. And we're still saying he's coming 2,000 years later. But we can look to Paul and, and, and he summarizes, hey, look, look at this history. But at all throughout these points of history, you see God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. Just as he promised, so will he do. God is a, is a God who makes promises, but those promises are not empty. They are not vain. He will keep his promises. And Peter encourages us through his letter, look, it may, it may look like God has forgotten, but God has not forgotten. And everything that he has said he will do he indeed will do. So continuing on in our passage, we pick it up in verse 24. Paul continues on saying, before his coming, John the Baptist had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no, but behold, after me one is coming the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. And so John, his job was to prepare the way for Messiah. And he clearly said he understood he was not the Messiah. And he said, look, 
it's not me. The one who is coming after me, I'm not even worthy to undo his sandal. Now, I want to take a, a quick aside here and just consider that ministry that, that John the Baptist had. This took me by surprise a few years ago as I was reading through the Old Testament. And as you read through the, the last book of our Old Testament, Malachi, there is this promise that God gave to Israel, that he would send someone who has the spirit of Elijah. He says, I will send to you Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and I will turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers, making ready their hearts to receive the Lord. And then what we see in Luke is John the Baptist's father serving in the temple. He is approached by an angel And he says, you're going to have a son who has the spirit of Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Now, I just want, this has had tremendous impact on my perspective of what ministry looks like, and even the ministry that John the Baptist had. I used to look at him as this crazy guy, because it talks about him being crazy in the desert, right? And, And... even Jesus is like, what did you go out there to see? A man dressed in camel's clothes, eating wild honey and locusts? Like, did you just go for the show? And I used to think of John going, repent, repent, repent. Like just a broken record. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, repent, repent. But what does it say? He had a ministry of getting into people's homes and he was turning the hearts of the fathers back to their children and turning the hearts of children back to their fathers. And that made them ready to hear the message of who Jesus is. How important is that message for us today? As we have fathers who are so too busy working, they're doing a great job of providing for their families, but they are abdicating their role of loving their family of leading in their homes. And we have kids who have totally abandoned and do not honor their father and mother, but they they forsake it for their peer guidance. We need this message today. We need to to get into the hearts of homes, to to the homes and turn the hearts of fathers back to the family. And we need to, to encourage our kids to turn their hearts back to their parents. And that will make their heart ready to receive. It'll create fertile ground so that the relationship with God can be cultivated. The scriptures, it's it's in the Ten Commandments. These things are so valuable to God that, that the family unit be a nurturing one and that that is what will bring about proper worship of God. When our, when our homes, when our, when our attention is, is in a loving way towards each other and that we take seriously our responsibility to train up our children in the ways of the Lord. It's a difficult task. It's monumental. This is the task that was given to John the Baptist. And it, this prepared people's hearts to receive the good news of who Jesus is and the kingdom that he was ushering in. But it was Jesus that was proclaimed by John the Baptist and that this message of salvation, as we'll see in verse 26 here, this message of salvation has been sent to all people, to Jew and Gentile. Read verse 26 with me. It says, Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us, has been sent the message of this salvation. Paul is not making any distinction between them. He's saying, hey, look, Jew, you who is a son of Abraham, you God-fearer, actually you are also a son of Abraham because of the faith that you have put in the God of Israel. To us, to all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, has this message of salvation been given 
Then he goes on to say, For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. We have here Paul just expertly laying out the truth of everything that happened and saying, hey, look, it was the Jews who put him to death. Oh, and if you high and mighty Gentiles think that you're excluded, it was also the Gentile rulers. Pilate condemned him to death, right? So Jews and Gentiles punished. They condemned Jesus to death on the cross. But all of this has been prelude to Paul's main point. All of this has been leading, beginning in verse 29 of our passage. When they had carried out all that was written of him, now, the people are not carrying around their scriptures saying, okay, now what do we need to do next? Okay, we need to barter over his clothes. We need to, no, no, no. All of these things were written in the scriptures and it's afterwards that we can look and it was seen Everything that was written about Jesus was fulfilled through his life and through his death and through his, what we will see now, his resurrection. They took him down from the tree. They laid him in the tomb. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. This is, this is, Paul's, this is what Paul is framing. Everything that, that was said before is leading to this entire basis. This, this, is, this is the driving force of everything that he wants to communicate. Jesus is, was crucified for our sins, but he has been raised from the dead. He has been risen, and it is because he has risen that we have any hope at all. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. We find this in what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul wrote it in this way. He said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive at the writing, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Jesus Christ was buried. He was dead. He didn't faint. He was dead. They buried him, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And then over the period of 50 days, he is appearing. It says at one time, he appeared to more than 500 people. This was no hallucination. This was no dream. These were people who testified that they saw Jesus risen again. And it's these people that went on to share this message. And some of them, most of them, would die for that confession. They were willing to die for their testimony. That's how strongly they believed in this truth. And it is the resurrection of Jesus that changes everything. It puts the stamp of approval on everything that he did. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes on to say, hey, look, if, if only in this life we have confidence in the resurrection of Jesus, then as Christians, of all people, we are the most to be pitied. Because we have all our hope in this one truth. That Jesus Christ died and that he has risen again. That is our hope. That's the foundation of everything that we believe. 
and the fact that he did all of these things, and it says it was in accordance with the scriptures, everything that he had communicated, every promise that God made, he kept. In Jesus Christ, he kept his promise. God's holy and sure blessings of David. As we see, as, a, as, as the, ver- the passage continues on in verse 34, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to ret- return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give to you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. It means their bodies decayed. They, their bodies were corrupted. If you went back to David's tomb today, you would not see life. You would see bones. You would see death took place and it took over and the decay continued. Their bodies saw corruption. Same with Solomon, same with every other descendant of David except for Jesus. He died but was not allowed to see corruption. His body did not decay in the grave. Now, Paul, as he's going through this, very similar to earlier addresses that we've seen in the book of Acts so far, as he's speaking to the Jewish people, he is referring to the Jewish scriptures, which is very appropriate for him to do. They will understand these things. And he he quotes out uh, in verse 33, he quoted Psalm 2, where uh, we read, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then he quotes another verse, and then he quotes in verse 35, another psalm, uh, you will not let your, let your Holy One see corruption. But in the middle was a nugget that I came across this week. Man, this is so cool. Verse 34 um, says that he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Now, where is that found? He doesn't give a reference to the to the to the bookmarking references he gives here's a psalm here's another psalm but this one is not a psalm this is actually found in isaiah chapter 55 verse 3 isaiah 55 3 reads incline your ear and come to me hear that your soul may live and i will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast sure love for david now Isaiah 55, if you are familiar at all with Isaiah's writings, you will recognize that starting in like Isaiah 52, Isaiah is giving this prophecy. He begins telling of the, this suffering servant that is going to come on the scene and he is going to be pierced. He is going to be beaten. This is Isaiah 53, where we read about the excruciating pain that this suffering servant must endure, and that he must ultimately die. And then Isaiah 54, God reassures his eternal covenant of peace based on the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, And then we find in Isaiah 55 this compassion that God shows for all people. And it it extends not just to all of Israel, but then in Isaiah 56, we read about salvation that is being offered to foreigners. Now, how important is this? So, So Paul is addressing this Jewish synagogue and these God fearers are here as well. But he is speaking and he's, he's, he's reassuring them hey, look, look what your scriptures are saying about this Messiah who would come. He would die. He would not see corruption. And then he gives this, this, this nugget, this little offering right in the middle. He says, I will give to you, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. And those blessings would extend to not just the people of Israel, 
but to every foreigner who comes to him by faith. We read these wor words in uh, Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 8. Read, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Hear are these promises, these, these promises that were that were to extend beyond the nation of Israel. This is something that Israel forgot. For whatever reason, they, 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 they just looked as these, to these promises as only being to themselves, and they never sought to be missional and to, to be the blessing that God had intended them to be. And yet it was always part of God's heart and his desire that his message of love would be for all people. So what do we see here? Paul continues on. After laying down all of this groundwork of speaking about the resurrection of Jesus, he says in verse 38, let it be known to you therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And there's, there's really a lot here that we could unpack, but really just boiling it down. This message of forgiveness is for everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah and that his life is for you. That his death was for you. That his resurrection has implications to you today. Everyone who believes. Paul continued when he wrote to Romans in Romans 10, 13. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is a recitation. This is a, a quote of Old Testament Joel. Joel 2, 32. It's an exact quote. God's heart has always been that you come to him by faith. Trusting in his goodness. Trusting in his promises. Believing that he is who he says he is. And taking his life for your own. But then, Paul concludes with a warning. Verses 40 through 43 of our passage says, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. He says, don't let that be true of you. Be warned. You have heard the message of the gospel. You have heard who Jesus is. You have heard why he did everything that he did. Don't turn a blind eye to it. Don't take it for granted. He says, beware. He doesn't want them to, to miss it. He doesn't want them to think that they're just all good because they've heard the message. No, they now need to respond. Russell Moore in his uh, article back in uh, February of 2012, he had these words. He says, for too long we have called unbelievers to invite Jesus into your life. Jesus doesn't want to be in your life. Your life is a wreck. Jesus calls you into his life. And his life isn't boring or purposeless or static. It's wild and exhilarating 
and unpredictable. God is a God who has made many promises. You read, you search the Old Testament scriptures, and you find that they all find their yes and amen in Jesus Christ. They are all fulfilled in Jesus. And yes, there are still many prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. But because of all of the prophecies that, that we can look at and we can verify, yes, this was said, of, it would be true of, of the Messiah, it was true of Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah. If all of those promises were true and they found fulfillment in Christ, then we can have, we can rest in the assurance that every promise that is yet to be fulfilled that will also be true of the Messiah will also be fulfilled in Christ. That includes your salvation. It includes your preservation. It includes your deliverance and ultimately being led to the promised land that he has promised for all who put in their faith in him that they would be with him in this place called heaven. In God's presence, wherever heaven is, that is where you will be. Because that's what God said would happen. And these are the promises we can look we can read, we can search, and we will find that Jesus is the one that we can put our confidence in. He calls us into his life to have our lives transformed by his life. What was the response of the crowd? In verse 42, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them again on the next Sabbath. I mean, why wouldn't they? They're, they are hearing the greatest news that could ever be told, and they've never heard it before. And so they hear it, and they're like, oh, would you please, would you please come back next Sabbath and tell us more about this? Verse 43, and after meeting in the, the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. I hope that that is your response to the gospel. I hope that what is, the warnings that are in Scripture of those who would be hardened to this message would not be true of you, but that you will see that the greatest hope that could ever be had in this life is found in Jesus Christ, having life in Him. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for today. We're thankful for your word that you have given to us. God, ultimately, I, I just, I thank you that you are, not only that you are a God who makes promises, but that you keep your promises. Thank you for Jesus who has fulfilled every promise that was spoken about him. And thank you for the confidence that we can have that all of those that have yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled in Christ. Lord, help us not to lose hope, not to lose patience uh, in this world as we see things going every which way. Help us to remember that you are the sovereign God over all of creation and that every purpose that you have said you will accomplish could never be thwarted by anything that happens in this life or beyond. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you for this time that we've had this morning to remind it, be reminded of your faithfulness, of your goodness, God. Help us to go from this place refreshed, renewed, and ready to take this message of the good news to be found in Christ to the lost and dying who are around us each and every day. Lord, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear the needs of those that you've put, put in our lives, that you would receive all the honor and all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this week. I invite you to come back next week.
and uh, we'll continue our study of the book of Acts. God bless you as you go.